This is Real Estate Rookie episode 292. I think that spending money on tax strategy or or kind of tax planning is one of the few things in your real estate business where if you put a dollar in, you get multiple dollars back. And yeah, definitely we we spent a decent amount on tax strategy uh, this year, but I can also say that I'm probably going to pay zero on taxes for 2022. And that's because I had the right person in my corner to guide me along to help me understand the tax code to leverage it in my in my benefit. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I am here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And I love getting back to our Rookie Reply episodes so we can get uh, down to the nitty gritty with all of our, our Rookie audience members. So Tony, before we get into our replies, I do have something I want to share with everyone today. I received a voicemail today and it was to my Google voice number, which is like my work number. And really this phone number is mostly used for direct mail. Um, So when we send out mailers, this is the number they would call. Um, We don't have it for like any property management at all. So I got this, this voicemail today and it was, hi, my name is Angela so-and-so. I am the director of human services for a town of Wyndham. I'm calling regarding a property at, and she gives the address. So if you're in Willimantic, Connecticut, maybe this is your property. So first of all, right there, I'm like, okay, this doesn't apply to me because I don't have any property in Connecticut. (laughs) There is an issue with sewage backing up into one of the apartments and code enforcement has been on the property and we need to hear from the landlord or property management company to determine what we are going to do. If we are going to relocate the tenant at your expense, put a lien on the property or if the property management will relocate the tenants, you can reach me at XXXXX. So right there is very, very interesting. So this tenant could not get a hold of their landlord or their property management company and called code enforcement and director of human services or, you know, one of them called each other. And there's sewage backing up into their apartment and nobody can get a hold of the property management company. Obviously, there's not a correct number here since they called me. Uh, But yeah, that they're going to relocate the tenants at their expense and then put a lien on the property for that expense if it is not paid. You see, I mean, like those are the kind of stories that upset me as a real estate investor, because that's why there's so many random people on the internet who are angry at us for being real estate investors because stories like this are the ones that they they hear about right the the landlord that's negligence the landlord that is um you know just taking money and not taking care of their tenants and it it kind of gives all of us a bad name so shame on that landlord and i i do hope they put a lien on on his or her property and uh, i who i do hope that they move that tenant at that landlord's expense because they've obviously completely dropped the ball on on uh making their property safe and usable for for their tenants yeah and you know what i'm actually so surprise that I did not do. And maybe because I actually am busy during the day, but I did not prop stream or Google this property since she gave me the address. I probably could find the owner for them. <laughs> Imagine like it is yours and you didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody put it in my name. <laughs> Somebody just like deeded a property to you and, and never yeah. even told you. So I'm looking, I pulled it up on Google Maps real quick here. And there's actually, it looks like a, a nice um, duplex here. I see like two mailboxes on it. But there's um, two people sitting on the the front porch, and they're actually waving at the the Google the Maps Google Street, uh, yeah. <laughs> camera that's yeah, going yeah. by. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so I do. I did try to call that person back, but it just was like a busy signal. Um, so I never got through back to them. Maybe it's some kind of scam. Maybe that's also true. Trying to get you to, to like wire money for something that's not even yours. That's true. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, we've we've got a few really good questions lined up for for y'all today. Uh, we're going to talk about taxes and uh, why taxes are so important, and kind of how you build your team around your tax strategy. And we'll also share how I plan to pay zero dollar in taxes uh, for last year. We talk a little bit about credit cards and how and when you should potentially use them to fund your real estate business. What are some of the advantages? What are some of the disadvantages? We, and then we also talk about debt. And I really enjoyed this conversation around. 
is there an opportunity for you to maybe have too much debt in your portfolio and and how can you kind of protect yourself against that? So lots of really good questions today, but before we keep rolling, I just want to give a quick shout out to someone by the username of Anthony F352. Anthony left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and says, this podcast changed my life. I am 25 years old and recently closed on my first home. It will be a live-in value add through sweat equity. I started listening to this podcast about a year ago, and it has changed my view on real estate in general. The information in these podcasts is so simply explained, helpful, and organized. Tony and Ashley have the best energy and tailor the content to all audiences. Thank you so much. Anthony, thank you for leaving that review and kudos to you. Congratulations to you for getting that first deal done. And for all of our rookies that are listening, if you haven't yet left us a rating review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever it is you're listening, please take a few minutes to do so because the more reviews we get, the more folks we reach, more folks we reach, more folks we can help. All right. So today's first question comes from Brittany Dave. And Brittany's question is, do y'all use a real estate specific CPA for your taxes or do you just have a regular CPA that is capable of handling real estate investment business? businesses. I'm just starting out and I would like to meet with a CPA to discuss matters and services that I will need from them for next year, but I'm not quite certain where to start. I'm in a rural area, so I don't have that many great options. Man, a lot to unpack from this first question. So the first thing that I'll say, and this is for Brittany, this is for every single rookie that's listening. If your plan is to build a relatively big real estate portfolio where you have more than maybe one or two deals, I think every single person should invest early and invest often into good tax strategy advice and into good tax preparation. Uh, because if you're able to set a strong foundation for yourself when you have your first property or, or even as you're gearing up for that first property, it makes the tax strategy and, and planning so much easier when you've got four, five, 10, 20, 30 properties. So that's, that's my first piece of advice is that I think, uh, us, me and my partners in our business, we waited too long to get that good tax advice. And it, it kind of came back to, to bite us in the butt. Um, I guess, Ash, before we even answer any of these, like any parts of Brittany's question, at what point in your business, like how many deals had you done when you hired a CPA to kind of help you out? Well, I didn't hire a specific CPA that was just real estate investing that I didn't do until last year. So quite a while into my investing journey. But the CPA that I did have prior to that, um, she does have knowledge of, you know, general knowledge of investment properties. The the thing I think to look at too is what kind of knowledge do you have? Um, it's the same with selecting a real estate agent. What do you need the agent for? So I actually went to school for accounting. I worked at a CPA firm. So I have a lot of knowledge. I definitely am not up to date on taxes and laws and everything like that. But I do know how to create my own financial statements. I do know how to read financial statements. I know how to read tax returns where if there was a mistake on the return, um, I could point it out most likely as long as it wasn't something like new or whatever. I so I think for me, it worked well because I knew a lot about taxes and accounting. So I didn't need as much from her. But anytime I did, I would just ask her, you know, the question or whatever it was. So I think how much guidance do you actually need? And then look at it more when first starting out. Is it actually a real estate CPA you need or is it a real estate bookkeeper? Like what do you need starting out? Because um, real estate specific CPAs can be expensive. Um, and I, I see here that Brittany had put that she lives in a rural area, same as me, where, you know, there's not a ton of options locally, but thankfully a lot of CPAs can do their work remotely where you're able to find a CPA across the country, as long as they have a knowledge of, you know, filing a tax return in the state that you are actually in. So there's also the difference between having a CPA that is filing your taxes. And that was basically what my first CPA did was just file the taxes and then doing having a CPA that is actually doing tax planning because there is a big difference between the two. And when you are hiring a CPA, you want to understand what is kind of involved in that. Like, are you actually going to get that kind of tax planning from them? Or are they there just to fill in the blanks of the tax return and to 
to complete that for you. Yeah, I, it's a it's a great call out, Ashley, about uh, tax planning versus tax preparation. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think I'll, I'll just like reiterate that I, I think that spending money on tax strategy or or, or, or kind of tax planning is one of the few things in your real estate business where if you put a dollar in, you get multiple dollars back. And yeah, definitely we, we spent a decent amount on tax strategy, uh, this year, but I can also say that I'm probably going to pay zero on taxes for 2022. And that's because I had the right person in my corner to guide me along, to help me understand the tax code, to leverage it in my, in my benefit so that I'm able to basically reduce my taxable liability down to zero. Um, and again, that, that comes from having, having the right CPA. So I think for me, Brittany, my answer would be, I would encourage you to find a CPA that specializes in real estate investing. And Ashley and I talked about this on a previous episode, but you know, I, I think a mistake that a lot of people make when they're looking for CPAs or attorneys or agents or whoever is they ask the question, do you work with real estate investors? And of course their answer is always going to be yes. But I think a better, more, more pointed question to ask is, what percentage of your current clientele are active real estate investors? And if the CPA says, hey, you know, 60, 70% of who I work with are uh, real estate investors. Okay, cool. Then you know that, that this person probably knows the ins and outs and all the intricacies that come along with investing in real estate. But if they're like, hey, I've got one or two clients out of a hundred that are real estate investors. Well, that's a, that's a pretty big difference. So I'd say definitely go with someone whose expertise is specifically in, in real estate investing. And the same for a bookkeeper too. As someone who's going, if you need a bookkeeper, is asking that they have experience in real estate because there are so many different industries and companies that require different ways of accounting, I guess, or say, where, you know, you're doing, um, you have depreciation, you're doing the amortization of principal and interest for a loan, you're accounting for um, fees differently. So there's, Whereas if you are doing maybe a retail store, that bookkeeper has knowledge of how to handle inventory, how to, um, you know, do payroll, things like that. So I think that's definitely something that's a huge advantage is getting a bookkeeper that is knowledgeable in real estate for sure. And they may be able to even help you with some of the, the allocations of how things should actually be. Yeah. And I guess just, just last thing, and, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, but Brittany says that she's in a rural area, so she doesn't have that many great options. But again, just to reiterate, your your CPA does not need to be local to you. Like Ashley said, as long as they have an understanding of the state that you live in and the tax implications and, and rules, et cetera, of that state, your CPA can be anywhere. Uh, my first CPA lived in a completely different state for me. My, my new CPA, she lives in California, but she helps uh, clients across the entire country. So you, you you can go the virtual route as you're looking for a potential CPA, Brittany. So that should hopefully open up your 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 options a little bit more as opposed to looking at someone in your your hometown. All right. So our next question comes from Sam Dang, and Sam's question is: What are the typical expectations as the quote unquote money partner within a joint venture deal? And this is something actually that you and I know a lot about is partnerships within the world of real estate investing. And we've had situations where uh, we've brought some capital. We've had situations where we've brought no capital and someone else has funded that. So when you think about a, a real estate partnership where one person is bringing the majority, if not all of the capital, what do roles and responsibilities and potential expectations look like between the money partner and the non-money partner? So this really is up to the partners as to what the role of the money partner is. But as far as like basic expectations is if they are the money, then when you are ready to close, they need to have that money ready to go. So that I would say is the first expectation that they know that they need however X amount of money and they need to have it ready to wire, to bring a money order, a cashier's check, whatever that may be to the closing table to close on your deal. The second expectation is they should not need their money back until the agreed upon time. So you don't want to get into the situation where you're two months into rehabbing a property with still another month to go and another month to sell it. Say it's a flip house and your partner says, I need my money. I need my money back. I need to pull it out now. Well, 
that that wasn't what your agreement was. So the, it should be the expectation that they can hold the money with you and won't need it back for the duration of the joint venture agreement for however long the deal is. And I think those are like the two major things is having that kind of understanding. And then as far as expectations for roles and responsibilities, that is up to you guys as partners. So my first ever partner was just the money partner and that is it. He has no say in operations. He has, I don't even honestly think he has access to the bank accounts, but there is, you know, he stays out of everything. He trusts me. He lets me go with it. And he just expects his check to get deposited every single month. And so I think with that, um, making those roles and responsibilities responsibilities clear in the beginning as you're forming the joint venture agreement. So like when I was a money partner in a joint venture agreement, I was entitled to ask for the bookkeeping at any time to see the financials of the property. I could request that. Um, Another thing may be that you're sending the money partner a monthly statement, just automatically the 15th of the month. Here's what we spent so far. Here's maybe where we are at the project, things like that. But that's up for you guys to decide, or it can just be, um, somebody who's just given the money and just saying, you know what, just let me know when my check's ready to, to pick up when we've sold the deal. Yeah. I think another important thing to clarify when there's a a money partner and a non-money partner is what are the terms of repayment? So you talked about timeline a little bit, like, you know, how long is that money going to be tied up in the deal, but also how is that person going to be paid back? Uh, are they going to be paid back through a certain, uh, maybe a fixed dollar amount throughout the life of the loan? So it's like, hey, uh, for as long as we have this deal, I'm going to pay myself back X dollars per month until I'm, I recapture whatever money I put into this deal. Are they going to be paid back maybe a percentage of the profits on a monthly, quarterly, or, or annual basis to say, hey, there was X amount of profit at the end of the year. I'm going to take 50% of that and pay myself back, and then we split the rest. Uh, are they going to be paid back maybe if you refinance after two or three years to uh, kind of pay back their initial capital, or do they wait until the sale? Or maybe they don't get paid back at all, right? And and their capital they've put into the deal is just their, since they're not putting any sweat equity, that's their contribution. So even when you go to sell or refinance, there's no repayments back to that partner, but you guys still split that money evenly. So I think that's an important thing to uh, kind of make sure there are clear expectations on are how, if at all, will this partner be paid back the, the capital they put in. All right. Let's jump down to our next question. This one comes from Bo Redfern. And Bo's question is, can you use credit cards for a down payment? Dave Ramsey is uh, punching the air right now. Um, what are your what are your thoughts, Ash? Have you ever seen anyone use a credit card for a down payment on a rental property? No, because I don't know if the bank would actually accept a credit card payment. So I think the only way that you could do it is to take a cash advance on the credit card, which I've never done that either. So I'm not sure, but there's very high fees for actually doing that. And the bank itself, like depending on what kind of loan you're using, if they see that you just got a cash advance on a credit card right before closing, that might even you know get you in trouble with underwriting and that could kind of throw your ability to close that deal uh, in jeopardy as well. Are they able to see that though, do you think? Your ba- your cash, ba- they, they should be able to see your balances on your credit cards, right? So like if you, if you ran up your balance- Well, when I think of cash advance, I think of like you go to the ATM and you're pulling out actual cash. So like it doesn't actually go into your bank account. But I I see where you're saying as like they want to see the proof of funds. Right. Because typically if there's like a large deposit while you're in escrow, they'll want to know. And this depends on the kind of loan that you're using. But like say you're using like a, a traditional personal loan and you have a big deposit uh, during your escrow period, most underwriters are going to ask, Hey, help us understand where this money came from in order to really clear your file. And you could be in a situation where like, Hey, I I pulled this from our credit card. They're like, okay, well, you don't actually have the money to, to close on this thing. Yeah. So I'm doing a refinance right now. And the only, and it's going to be in my personal name. And the only reason, or the only time they asked for bank statements was when I first applied for the loan and they have not asked again, and I'm closing in four days. So I think that also depends too. Are they going to actually ask for bank statements again to actually see that deposit? Because my banking, I don't do with the same loan or same 
business or same bank that's doing the the mortgage. My bank accounts are at a different bank. So it's not like they can automatically go and look. Um, and I think if you did do the, the advance on the credit card, it probably wouldn't show up on your credit yet that your minimum payment has increased on that credit card. But also minimum payments are so minuscule because it's just that little, little bit of interest, not even the whole interest sometimes. So that may not even affect your, your debt to income if it were to show up on your credit report before closing. Yeah, I, I think I would just also, Bo, really think through uh, your your repayment plan for that. If you say you are able to kind of find a way to do that, because like Ashley said, you know, interest rates on credit cards are, are pretty high. And if you're funding an entire down payment, th- that that could be a pretty significant amount of money every single month. Um, and we don't know the amount that you're looking for, Bo, so that could play a factor here as well. But I would hope that if you're using it in that capacity, that you've got a really clear path to repaying that quickly, either because you plan to rehab this property and then maybe refinance a few months down the road to pay off that credit card. But I, I would just caution against trying to maybe have that uh, that open balance too long on that credit card because you never know what could happen. I was just trying to Google real quick, uh, 0% interest credit cards for cash advances. But just like quickly looking, it looks like the cash advances don't apply to the 0%, which makes sense because credit card companies make money off of every time you swipe the card because that vendor is paying those transaction fees for you to use your credit card. And that's how they make their money. If you take that cash advance, they're not making that money on um, you swiping the card. So That's actually true as well. I, what you see a lot of folks do, Bo, is they'll use credit cards, not for the down payments, but if you're rehabbing a property, they'll use like a 0% interest credit card to fund all of the material purchase because that now you've got 18 months to pay that bad boy off and hopefully you can kind of rehab and, and float the property in that time frame. Um, and you don't, you don't have to worry about the limitations of the cash advance. So I, yeah, I don't think I've met anyone that's used a credit card to fund the down payment on a rental property. So maybe not the, maybe not the best path forward. I think one thing that you could do is, okay, so you could take the cash advance from it. Um, you probably, I mean, I don't think you can get that much of a cash advance uh, compared to what the limit is. So maybe you have to open several of them to take the the cash advances on all of them to have enough for a down payment. But um, one thing you could do is look at your everyday expenses and put those on a 0% interest credit card and then save what you would normally be spending in cash and then use that for your down payment. So you're still in the situation where you're going to owe money because you're going to have to pay off that credit card. But this way, at least you're not paying interest on, um, you know, doing that cash advance. So if there's a way that, you know, if you look at your monthly expenses and you can dump them all onto the credit card and then take that cash that you would normally spend on your bank account and use that towards your down payment. Um, only do this if you know that you are diligent and you can pay off your credit cards. Um, I don't want anyone to get into credit card debt. Um, (laughs) Dave Dave Ramsey would have our heads. (laughs) All right, let's jump to our, our next question here. This one comes from Julie Glasser. And Julie's question is, for those of you who list your flips for sale by owner, how do you deal with realtors who contact you up front asking if you'd be willing to pay them a a commission if they bring you a buyer. So before we even answer Julie's question here, I I just want to define what she means when she says, list your flips for sale by owner. So oftentimes when you sell a home or you go to, to list a home for sale, you contact a real estate agent or realtor, and then they turn around and list your property on the MLS. And then they are in charge of doing the showings, basically finding you a buyer, uh, then facilitating that transaction from the time that you open escrow until you actually close on the sale. And that's how realtors make a living, right? They find buyers, they find sellers, match them up, and they take a split of, of the commission. Going for sale by owner means you bypass the real estate agent. And instead of using the, the, the agent to list and find buyers and facilitate that transaction, you do all of that work yourself. Now, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I feel like I've heard it and seen it in so many different places that the majority of people who sell, uh, who list their properties for sale, for sale by owner tend to make less money. Uh, and the folks who use agents 
tend to be able to draw a, a slightly higher purchase price. Um, and it's because that's what they do for a living. That's what they're good at. So first, I would just really have you question yourself, Julie, what is your motivation for going for sale by owner? Do you have the experience to market your property correctly, to uh, find a buyer, to really facilitate that transaction, to negotiate effectively? Because every purchase of a home has some level of negotiation in terms of credits from the seller and things of that nature, especially right now, given that it's more of a buyer's market than a seller's market. Uh, if you don't have that experience, you could find yourself in, in kind of a tough situation. I actually got a phone call today. So I'm selling a building for a sale by owner. And I got a call today from a real estate agent that said, and so her office is actually right next door to this building. And she said she had somebody walk into her office and ask about it. So she's like, I just thought I would call and get some information. And so I told her about the building, what the price was, things like that. And she said, you know, I, you know, if I end up having a buyer, I'll let you know. And I can usually work out terms with the buyer where they're paying my fee. And uh, so I thought that was actually interesting that it wasn't her first question wasn't, would you be willing to pay me a commission if I'm able to find a buyer? She was already saying I might be able to have a, or I probably can have a buyer pay my fee for negotiating this deal for them and, and getting it done. And, but I, I ended up saying to her, I was like, if, and if that doesn't work out, I would be open to negotiating something with you too, if you did bring a buyer to the deal, because I, I think it is worth it. And in that situation, you're not signing a listing agreement where you're locked in with one real estate agent. So everyone that calls you, you can say, sure, go ahead. <laughs> it, whoever brings you the buyer first, you know, gets that commission. And I'm not sure how that would work as far as fees and stuff, but it's probably going to be um, a situation where you're paying maybe a less than you would if you were to get a listing agent. But I don't know that offhand. Typical fees around here are 6% to sell a property where 3% goes to the buyer's broker's office and then the other 3% goes to the seller's broker's office where this would almost kind of be a dual agent scenario, but they wouldn't be working on your behalf. And one reason this works so well in New York state is because you have to use attorneys to close anyway. So basically your attorney can just work directly with their attorney and you don't, you know, you can bypass the agent in some aspects where a dual agent can, can be fine. It's that negotiating part. So if you feel comfortable you know, negotiating directly with an agent and not having an agent represent you, then I think this would be a fair scenario, especially if the property is sitting and it's not selling. Calculate how much you'd actually be giving up in commission and maybe it's worth it. Yeah. I, you mentioned about 6% for where you're at. I want to say uh, for the properties that we bought and sold recently, we're, we're around like 5% in the markets that we're at in California. So two and a half to the uh, listing agent two and a half to the to the buyer's agent, which uh, seems pretty reasonable. And also, that is sometimes negotiable. So the investor that I've done work for, and just like he used to make me ask for discounts all the time, and I would get so embarrassed. I'm like, no, please don't make me. But like one thing he always did was, ah, tell him we'll do five percent instead of six. Just tell him, tell him, like. Uh, but this is like his job. Like he's just trying to make money. Like, you know, I get all heartfelt, like embarrassed that I was, you know, trying to make somebody every single time the person be like, yeah, okay, sure. And I was just like amazed. And now I've like overcome that fear completely as to like asking for a discount because every single time he proved me wrong that they wouldn't say no. And, um, yeah, so it worked out well. And if they say no, okay, they say no, that's it. And then you agree to what originally was asked and move on. And for, you know, for all of our Rickies, I think that's a benefit as well is that you can position yourself as a real estate investor. You're not just a one-time client that's going to buy a house every two decades. Like you say, Hey, I'm going to buy two houses a year for the next five years, right? Like I'm going to be a volume client for you. And that's leverage that you can have because now they don't have to hustle up for that next client. They know they're going to be able to work with you at least a, a couple times this year. So uh, Julie, I would just say for yourself, like really think about what your motivation is for going for sale by owner. Um, and like Ashley said, I, I don't think I would necessarily turn down a buyer's agent if they came to me with a buyer because it, it means that, you know, that's a little bit less work on, on your end, but you have to ask yourself if you feel that it's worth, uh, the cost associated with this. Now, the last thing to kind of keep in mind too is that you, you also want to think about 
how much time is it going to take for you to find a buyer and facilitate that transaction on your own? And if bringing in a buyer's agent can maybe cut that time in half, now there's less, there's less holding costs, right? There's less maybe headache around you managing this property yourself if, if that's what you're doing. So there's other factors to consider as opposed to just like, Hey, I don't want to pay any agents, any fees whatsoever. All right. So our next question here comes from Chiloe Carter Davis. And Chiloe's question is when buying property that you will owe on for 20 to 30 years, are you concerned with having so much debt as you continue to add to your portfolio? For example, having five $200,000 homes, definitely in times like now when being evicted for not paying rent is being somewhat protected. So it sounds like uh, Chiloe's question here is around, should you continue to use leverage to purchase real estate uh, investments as your portfolio scales? Or maybe should you think about paying off some of your rentals so you don't have uh, or so you don't exceed a certain level of debt? So sounds like Chiloe might be uh, drinking the Dave Ramsey Kool-Aid a little bit here as well. Uh, what are your what are your thoughts on that, Ashley? Should you, put, should you should you put a cap on the amount of debt that you have in your rental portfolio? Well, I think that the fear she states out is that evictions are you know, taking a lot longer uh, because of COVID where there was the eviction moratorium. I have somebody that has lived in a unit for 12 months um, without paying rent because they keep applying for state or county funding. And it's about four months behind. So like by the time it's processed, they're another four months behind on rent. But you can't evict them while they have submitted an application for this funding. Then once the funding is approved or denied, you can go ahead and start the eviction. But if the funding has been approved and they get funded, they can go ahead and apply again. So then it will stop the eviction again. Uh, So I actually just got a huge payout uh, for for this tenant, but now they're still like, I think it's three months behind right now. So we'll see what they're their next move is. But, um, so I think that that is such a fair fear is what if all of my tenants stop paying rent? I can't get them evicted because of whatever the state laws are, things like that. Um, so I think what I like to, to kind of make me feel better is that I have different properties in different areas. So I may only invest in New York right now, but all of those properties are in different areas and different townships. So in some of the rural areas, I like the court just like goes so much faster and smoother in some of them where it's super easy to evict because it's such a small town and other ones, it takes forever because they only go to court once a month and there's not a ton of court states available. You have to line up with your attorney, things like that. Um, So I think a big thing would be to really, if that is a big fear of yours is to kind of diversify in different markets uh, to kind of, you know, have that protection of, okay, if you can no longer evict in this county or this town or whatever it may be, then you have your other properties to kind of lean on. And that's an advantage of growing your portfolio. So if you have a lot of doors, it's a lot more cost effective to have a couple that are vacant or non-rent paying If you have two doors and they both stop paying rent, that is detrimental. If you have 20 doors and two of them stop paying rent, that may be some of your cash flow is now covering those payments until they're evicted or until they start paying, where it's not like you're taking money out of your W-2 or finding money somewhere else and drowning trying to, to make these payments. So as far as like over leveraging yourself, I always keep a couple properties that are Debt free that have no mortgage on them. I mean, they're not very, they're not high end properties where it's, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars that I'm letting sit in these properties. But that's something that kind of gives me a peace of mind so that if I needed to, if I feel myself getting into a situation, I could sell that property, get a big lump sum and use that to carry me on. Or I could go ahead and refinance that property and put a mortgage on it. I, there's a there's a social media profile that I, I I follow and I think it's it'd be cool to shout him out right now but it's 
Mark Ferguson, he goes by invest for more on Instagram. So invest F O U R more. And th the reason I bring him up is because he always talks about uh, every quarter and annually his goals. And almost every time he talks about his goals, one of his things that he lists as a goal is to increase his debt. And he always says, I want, I want, you know, X millions more in debt this year. And the reason Mark says that is because he understands that the more debt he has, the more property he property he owns, the more cash flow he gets in return. So I, I do think that there's a smart way to to leverage debt, Chiloe, and and I think it's natural, like Ashley said, to have some fear around that. And the the tactics that Ashley gave to make it less fearful, I think, are solid. So I'll, I'll just try and add some more uh, flavor to that. I think first is is your reserves. Like Ashley talked about having properties paid off, which is a, a great approach. Um, but like for me, you know, we have properties that are five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars. Like it's it's unrealistic for us to have those properties fully paid off. But what does make sense is to potentially have uh, a reserves target. So maybe you want three months of principal interest and taxes and insurance. Maybe you want six months. Maybe you want nine months. Maybe you want a year of payments just sitting, sitting in an account for each property. And maybe your commitment to yourself is, I'm not going to buy another property until I have a year's worth of principal interest, taxes, and insurance saver for the, the current portfolio. And now that gives you a year for every single property to really be able to decide on what to do if things kind of hit the fan. Um, the next thing you can kind of look at is your overall uh, loan to value, like your, your debt to equity level across your entire portfolio. So a lot of times you look at one property and say, hey, this property is worth 80,000. Uh, I'm sorry, this property is worth 100,000. We owe 80. So we're at an 80% LTV. But it's also sometimes good to look at that across your entire portfolio. And maybe you want to say, hey, across my portfolio, I want to be at a 60% loan to value. So maybe I have some properties that are at, at 90 or 80 because I just bought them. But then my other ones need to be at 30 or 40% to kind of off, offset that. So across my entire portfolio, I have 40% equity if I add everything up. So I think looking at both your reserves target and your equity across your portfolio are two ways to maybe make you feel a little bit more comfortable adding on that additional debt. Yeah, that's great advice, especially the reserves, like having those reserves in place when you're first starting out. Like I would even add on to that and say for your first couple, lean towards that six months range. And then as you continue to grow and scale, you may not need six months of reserves for every single property because that's a lot of cash <laughs> that can be sitting and the chances of all of them you know, needing your reserves at once are low. And then that's where you, if that did happen, that's where you tap into your lines of credit and things like that. But yeah, I, I think that's great advice. You know, but it it also depends on the partnership, right? Because was it this episode where we were talking about partnership, maybe the last episode? Um, but like for us, we we actually have to keep our reserves separate because for so many of our properties, we have a different partner on each one of those. So like for me, I can't say, hey, if, if things hit the fan on property A with, with partner A, I'm going to take money from there and put it to part to property C. So we've, we've had to build out kind of a separate uh, reserves for each one. And it's so crazy with like the way that reserves work. Like a lot of our properties in Joshua Tree, they were all built between uh, late 2020, 2021, 2022. So they're all relatively new properties. But some of them have just had more issues than others. And some of those properties, we've literally never touched the reserves once. And other ones, it feels like every couple of months, we're almost emptying the reserves out because some big maintenance thing happens that we have to go back and, and replace. So um, yeah, I, I do think reserves gives you peace of mind. And honestly, the way that we stated it in our partnership agreements is that the majority of our cash flow is supposed to go, go towards building the reserves until we hit, I think, a certain threshold. I think it's like three months or something like that um, of principal interest taxes and insurance. Make sure we have that that buffer there. I can just hear Daryl and I'm sure a lot of other people are thinking of someone that's going, ah, things just aren't made the way they used to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is true. Which is true. Thank you guys so much for joining us for this week's Rookie Reply. If you would like to submit a question, you can go to biggerpockets.com slash reply, or you can visit us on Instagram and go to our link tree to click on the link to submit your Rookie Reply question. I'm Ashley at Wealth From Rentals, and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson, and we will be back on Wednesday with a guest. We'll see you guys next time. Still